Welcome back to KTN Weekend Prime. Tonight we are discussing quite an important topic, one that has been with us for the past 32 years, and that is HIV and AIDS, but more, more recently, the edict, the directive of President Uhuru Kenyatta on the 23rd of February this year, that all children and as well as their guardians have their names put down, especially children who are HIV positive, have their names put down on a list from uh, including uh, things such as details such as the schools, the location, the sub-location. Of course, the president saying that this was in an effort to be able to create enough data so that these children can have access to treatment. The statistics on testing of children and adolescents in Kenya is quite low. In fact, there's, there's quite a huge complaint about the numbers uh, with regard to absolute figures in terms of testing from some quarters. But is that directive legal? Is it going against the law? Will it help? in the fight against HIV and AIDS. And with me tonight, I've got three guests to discuss this. I've got right to my extreme right, I've got Florence Anam. She's a communication and advocacy expert at NEFAC. And right in the center, I've got Sister Mary Owens, a Loretta Convent sister, but she is uh, from Children of God's Relief Institute, more commonly known, of course, as Nyumbani. And with us again is Alan Maleche from Kellin. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, all of you. Now, we, we, we've seen the quote, and you, you obviously are very familiar with the president's statements and the directive. Um, let's start with you, Sister Mary. Mm -hmm. Is this directive in force? I believe it is, yes. Uh, on the 10th of March, a staff member of one of our um, community-based programs, Lea Toto, brought me a letter which they had received asking for the names of the children in our center and personal details. Then came a phone call from another center and then from another center and then our two schools in Nyumbani village, uh, Kutui County, also got requests. So I had to make a decision and I said, we'll put it on hold. You'll put it on hold? Hold, yeah. All because right. I couldn't leave it with our staff to take that uh, responsibility of not uh, require answering what was required. All right. Then a fortuitous phone call got me in contact with Kalen and Nefak, and so we were able together to um, talk about this. Immediately I knew it was a violation of the Constitution. I had just recently given a presentation on the rights of children living with HIV, so I was very briefed on it. Yes. So I was blessed in that way. All right. All right, Florence, um, let's come to you now. Um, people, there, there have been responses, of course, when we put out these questions online, and a number of people have been saying, what, what is the problem with, with uh, the, having the names of children um, on a list if it's going to help them access treatment? Um, actually, the, the situation in Kenya is not that enabling for persons living with HIV as it is. There is very high levels of stigma and discrimination. People are stigmatized, and especially those young children. There's the schools from which we have to name which schools they come from, which sublocations they are from, are not even conducive as it is for those that are accessing treatment. So when you start putting names to people, then you actually just fuel it. I'll just give you an example of some case we got from the field. Um, because this was supposed to be, uh, the directive was supposed to be um, implemented uh, between, with guidance between uh, the collaboration between Ministry of Health, yes. I mean, County Director of Health and County Director of Education. So headmasters, I mean, head teachers were asked to give names as well. And so these people don't know how to do this. So the head teacher calls children to an assembly and starts asking them. Um, how many of you are HIV positive? Of course the kids are, are, are shocked and they are not going to say they are. And on realizing that the children are not going to say anything, he starts to ask a series of questions. Of course in Kiswahili. So this, is, this is in an assembly? In an assembly, publicly. You know, so how many of you have been sick with any ailment, including skin diseases? So, I mean, it's a school and it's a primary school. Most of the kids' hands go up. And then he realizes, okay, that is probably not what I'm looking for. And then we, we go through a series of questions until we get to, how many of you have lost parents? And for me, that is in itself, you know, 
profiling of the child and making them feel uncomfortable and making them feel like there's something wrong with them. True. These children are already going through so much as it is. And for me, before we make the environment okay enough for a person living with HIV to stand and be able to say, I'm here, I don't think we need to put names. We have data. It may not be conclusive. It may not be the best. But we have something to go by which we can be able to use if we want to make decisions in terms of how to reach these children. Okay, Alan, the CIC has written to um, the president and has written to the office of the president with respect to this, um, that the letter of which I think we'll have on our, up on our screen soon. Um, legally speaking, is there any way that uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta could have made this directive and it find uh, the backing of law in, in order for it to work? Alan, it would be impossible for this directive to be within the confines of the law unless certain measures are taken. Uh, firstly, I'd like to make it clear that we are not against the directive and the intention of the president to support children who are living with HIV, particularly adolescents, to get appropriate services. But what we are against is linking a person's name with their HIV status, which is clearly wrong according to what the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Act says at Section 20. We are also aware that nine years ago the HIV Act came into place and the Ministry of Health was mandated to put privacy guidelines in place to address such situations. We still don't have that guidelines in place. Yeah. Apart from the letters from CIC, there are letters from the Office of the Ombudsman, Kelly, Nefak, Nyumbani and other organizations wrote to the President advising him that it is not possible to get the names this way and it is possible to provide services to people living with HIV without having access to their names. We have offered help, we have offered suggestions, but we have received no response. All right, and this is two months down the road from uh, the initial speech and the initial directive um, to have um, children, uh, children's names on these kinds of lists. Uh, what does that speak to with respect to um, what's happening on the ground, perhaps? Uh, do you think that this is going to affect in any way us sitting here and talking about it? Do you think that it's going to affect in any way the fact that these lists are still being collected? Well, as my colleagues have said, Sister Mary indicated and uh, Florence has indicated, the directive indeed has been operationalized. County commissioners have worked to get these names, but some county governments have been wise not to give the names. Some have given. Some government agencies are now holding lists with people's names, and so the violations have already happened. And it's uh, unfortunate because if the directive remains in force, if the directive is not formally withdrawn by the head of state, people will still continue asking for names. And as rightfully said by Florence, the issue of stigma is quite vital. We have made so much gains in Kenya yeah. where people can now openly speak about their HIV status. But when we do this and when the government does this, we want to reverse those gains. I want to emphasize that it is possible to give services to people without having to get their names. And I believe it is within the mandate of the Ministry of the Health to properly advise the head of state on this matter. Unless, of course, the head of state chooses not to listen to that advice. Okay. Sister Mary, we are dealing with a dilemma in a sense here, where um, the right to privacy, as uh, the, the, the Commission for the Implementation of the Constitution pointed out in its letter to uh, the President mm -hmm. that Article 19, uh, Article 31, mm -hmm. beg your pardon, on the right to privacy, as mm -hmm. well as um, various uh, se sections of the of the laws on HIV, mm -hmm. have been contravened by this. So we're in a we're in a dilemma, where there is this contravention of the law, but there are very few statistics on HIV, especially HIV prevalence in, in certain groups like children, adolescents. How then do we collect the data without going in contravention of the law? For the last 23 years, that's been our work, trying to find the children. What we do in our community-based care program, we have a cohort of social community health workers and they live in these communities, so they're not threatening to the people. And so they, when they spot some child is sick or the mother is sick, um, they go and talk with them and poly poly, they invite them, maybe you'd like to take the child to Lea Toto. And so 
that's one way we get to the children. Also, we talk in barazas, in churches, in schools. We even go from house to house. We had moonlight testing as well. So it's to try and reach people because if we reach adults and they test positive, then if there are children, we may have an entry to find those children. All right, but legally speaking, Alan, I'll just come back to you on this. Um, legally speaking, what what is the proce procedure with how a child or an adolescent can test? Because I'm assuming that, for instance, if you're 15 years old and you've just made your sexual debut or you've had sex a couple of times and you contract HIV or you think you have, would you need a guardian to be there while you are testing? Are these some of the things that stand in the way of... of uh, not at all, John. Not at all, John. When the HIV Act was being drafted, the drafters had in mind of the difficult situations that people become sexually active before they reach the age of 18. When you look at sections 14 and sections 15 of the HIV Act, you will see that they emphasize that children if they're to take a HIV test, the parents should give consent. Mm -hmm. However, the act gives exceptions and says a child who's pregnant, a child who's married, a child who is a parent, and any child who is engaged in risky behavior that puts them at a risk of getting HIV, then such a child can directly consent for a HIV test without the parent's consent so long as they understand the effects and the implication of that particular test. So the law in place is enabling to ensure that people are able to test. The challenge which is in place and which this directive poses is that how are we addressing the issues of stigma and discrimination that make it difficult for people to come out and test for and know their HIV status? How are we addressing that? So the law is not a legal barrier in terms of people testing and equally it provides ways in which you can handle the data that has been collected. Yeah. And as I said earlier, the absence of the privacy guidelines that are provided to be made by the Minister of Health in the HIV Act is what has put us in this particular problem. Okay, 16% of the 1.6 million people in this country um, who are HIV positive are adolescents. Now, uh, Florence, you represent quite a number of people who are HIV positive, living positively. Is stigma alone the reason why we have such low numbers among adolescent groups as, as, and children? as well because it's been it's been quite some time since we've lived with HIV and AIDS um, quite a number of us believe that there have been many strides made in terms of trying to drive down stigma and improve the quality of testing especially the privacy around it is that the only problem um, I think we have made a lot of strides in terms of educating people and and, and creating awareness and and People are a bit more tolerant. However, we are not at an ideal. And um, for the larger population, the adults, the, the probably the mostly the adults, we've done a lot of work to make people understand, and we've tried to make structures and put structures in place to make these things work. However, we, we have great strides in science. We have great strides structurally. I think we have. We are not there yet, but we are making the right direction. However. Stigma continues to remain the major reason why people are not, A, even coming up for testing. We have had a call for HIV testing, voluntary HIV testing, for almost over a decade now. But still, we are not at 100% of people knowing or having access to HIV testing. Right. If I take it down to um, adolescents or children, we have um, a lot of other issues between communities and health facilities, sociocultural, and, and those other um, uh, challenges that make it impossible for children to know their HIV status. We test women when they're pregnant, and then um, we probably test them when they're delivering, yeah. and then that's it, you know? So this child will probably not get tested again unless they become sick. They will probably not get tested again until they probably decide to on their own, or maybe they're till I get 18 to 18. Okay. So most of the adolescents probably have HIV and they do not know it. Okay? All right. So Sister yeah. Mary, since we're on the subject of testing, how mm -hmm. then can we, or the president, tweak or rescind or change his directive so that we can scale up testing to, uh, to ensure that we get the ki right kind of numbers that we're looking for and then be able to get, give treatment where it's needed? First, I want to say I was at the launch 
of the All In. And I was simply thrilled that His Excellency was really taking on board finding the children and the adolescents, right? So it's, it's the method that is the problem, all right? So um, I believe that a countrywide um, helping to find people through community strategies, these health um, structures that are in place in the sub-counties and in the wards, that using that process um, can help to find the children. What we're trying to do is to find them. Those who are already on care, in care and treatment, they're all right. It's the ones who haven't yet yeah. been reached. But wait, do, yes. would this list also gather the names of those yeah. who are already on and treatment? That's what they were looking for from our centres, you right. see? Okay. And it's known, our, our, because the government has all these records, yeah. you follow. All right, so yeah. how then do we change that? How then do we change the process to, to enable uh, the government get the statistics that it needs? Mm. Fortunately, I met His Excellency the President after the launch, and I made an appeal, the eradication of stigma. Mm -hmm. It is stigma which is preventing parents bringing their children, getting tested themselves. The stigma is absolutely lethal. Just a few days ago, I heard that a parent in a school who was bringing her child to the school for the first time was told, tell your daughter not to associate with those. And then when I heard which school, I knew it was our children. So that's dreadful just at this stage, yeah, 32 that. years. So that's very that's very unfortunate. There's no yeah. place for that, but unfortunately yeah. these so things that is why keep on it's happening. So that's why so difficult. Yeah. So I think all of us in Kenya have to take this on, right from the grassroots, not top down, but from the grassroots, to make sure that these children get the care and treatment. We have our children growing up, beautiful. They're now out there in the community. And so it's lovely to see that that they can have full lives All right. because they got care and treatment. Okay, Alan, we've heard now that there actually are effects to the directive uh, from both Florence and Sister Mary. If the directive is not rescinded, what next? Uh, good question, John. What next? One, I think in light, three things I'd like to say in light of how could the president go about this or anyone else who's interested in helping the children. The first thing is that the president needs to recall the directive of the 23rd and he needs to issue a fresh directive saying that any names collected will not be used or the data will be destroyed. We are calling for this because we've heard from county commissioners saying that if there's a directive from the president, by law they have to follow it. So it's only the president who can call this directive back. Secondly, the whole issue of the privacy guidelines need to be developed on an urgent basis and in a consultative process with all the stakeholders. So that if we have these privacy guidelines in place, and if the president or any other person needs to collect data, they will work within the guardians of the laws and these privacy guidelines. Thirdly, John, the whole issue of looking at the existing data and what gaps are there and then determining what other additional information needs to be taken on board needs to happen. Yeah. And as rightfully suggested by Florence and Sister Mary Owens, the president and others who are interested in helping people living with HIV should work closely with networks of people living with HIV, should work closely with community health care workers, should work closely with peer support groups to help them on this. And of course, as we've already put the government on notice, if this directive is not withdrawn, we would have to go to court and have it declared unconstitutional. All right, all, all right. The, the, the president already, at least the people around him, already seem to be alive to this. That's a letter. Um, from from the the, uh, the chief of, ch of of staff, I believe, um, asking uh, asking the the, the Gidon Wigai as well as the cabinet secretary for health to act on the issue and look into the issues that have been raised. But that was the 10th of April. We are now exactly a month yeah. after this this letter was sent. Mm -hmm. Exactly a month after this, and this continues to happen. Mm -hmm. How much longer are you going to have to wait before you go to court? Well, John, we have really tried to 
avoid a situation where we have to go to court on this. Mm. We felt this was a very straightforward matter and when we learned about this directive, our first letter to the president was on the 11th of March. We've never received a response to it. Our second letter to him was on the 24th of March. We never got a response to that and not only did we write to the president, we wrote to the Council of Governors, we wrote to all the human rights commissions, we wrote to all the UN agencies, we wrote to the Minister of Health, we wrote to the Director of NAC, pointing out and advising them, please speak to the president because this would embarrass our head of state if this information got to the larger public, but no action has been taken. We've gotten steps by the CIC, we've gotten steps being taken by the office of the ombudsman who have written further letters to alert the head of state that enforcing this directive would lead to a violation of human rights. So how much longer we don't know. As I said, we have already put the government on notice. We have written to the various government agencies and informed them that we feel we have given enough advice and that yeah. if the directive is not rescinded, we shall be going to court. And I do believe we shall be going to court shortly. All right, Florence. Um Assuming that the president has now heard um, or is now going to act on, on your advice, um, you or your advice collectively, what would an anti-stigma campaign look like from your point of view? Having heard the opinions of people living with HIV and AIDS, what would they like the messaging to be? I, I think messaging is different for different target groups. But um, I think, uh, first and foremost, I would like to say that before this directive was actually given out, persons living with HIV and other key stakeholders were not involved. So we were not even aware of what's going on until we start getting calls from agitated people living with HIV being harassed at the counties. So I think um, we are the wearer of the shoe. We know how it feels and we know what we feel. And we are very good at telling you what we want, you want to hear. I mean, uh, we, we speak well to ourselves. So I think the president or anyone who is interested in helping persons living with HIV, and I think our, uh, we, we, we are very strong around the fact that we are welcoming the fact that the president is trying to help adolescents. Yeah. He's probably the first president I've seen take that on that initiative, and he should be lauded for that. However, he needs to be advised to do it in a way that does not seem to take us 10 years back in terms of stigma or put our children or put our pregnant mothers or breastfeeding mothers who also are supposed to be listed, mm -hmm. um, you know, feel like they are being harassed or they're, they're, they're now, their lives are being, you know, put out in the open for people to see. So involve people living with HIV to come up with the messaging. There are some of us who are able to to act as change agents, we are strong enough, and it did not take one day. Um, I mean, disclosure is a process. It did not take one day to, to, to get to sit on this uh, podium and represent people living with HIV. So how do we, the few of us who are able to do it at different levels, get engaged to talk directly to communities? Again, secondly, use the family-centered approach. We are talking about children here. The best way to access children is through their parents or their guardians. And if we use the existing uh, mechanisms for testing, which are within NASCOP, um, the National AIDS and STI Control Program, they, they are forms that don't, do not require names. They are ways that we identify people after we test them. So can we have maybe a rapid you know, initiative you know, to, to test, to you know, expand testing for adolescents and children and then get the data if that is what is missing but we won't need to put out names aside from the family setup um, what else can be done because if we were to assume that family setup would be the most effective way of dealing with this then we'd be assuming that the family isn't under threat in Kenya and that there aren't as many broken homes as there are there aren't as many single parent homes as there are and adolescents themselves wouldn't be able to think of their own ways of dealing with um, the stigma around disclosure. What, what are they saying? What are, what are the teenagers, the young men and women saying about how they'd want to be dealt with with respect to disclosure? Um, actually, good question. Um, NEPAC recently um, started an initiative for adolescents and young people. Um, they call themselves Sautis Kika. 
um, a name designed by them. Uh, it's young people aged 10 to 24. They are living with HIV. And I think um, if you look at the, the Twitter uh, handle right now, they are very busy telling everyone mm -hmm. what they feel. They do not feel that their names need to be given to people they don't trust. That is the yeah. one thing they have asked that I see. And the young people, and, and this we did out of an operational research, why is it that young people don't want to come for treatment? Why is it that they don't want to test? Even the ones that know their HIV status, why do they stop taking medication? And the one thing they say collectively is the fact that they are tired of being identified with this disease. So these are young people telling you in their own voice that we don't want to be identified with this disease. They Beyond don't want to be HIV, I am a young person, I like football, I like to cook, I like this and I like that. I want to be known for those things. So how do we create an environment in which a young person does not feel like, oh, those are the people who are... HIV positive. See, they are going to that room to now get milk because the president decided they should be getting milk at lunch. All right, Sister Mary, as we, as we conclude, um, mm -hmm. do you think that the directive, as is being enforced right now, envisages confidentiality? But there's no confidentiality about the way the data is being collected at the moment. Mm -hmm. At All least right. in the sense that yes. the, the, the officers who are collecting this data yes. would treat it as, well, as confidentially as they can. I would hope so, but you know, it's it's uh, you know it's the grassroots are, people are collecting and then it goes up further and up yeah. further. Whether this confidentiality kept or not, I don't know. All right. Yeah. Alan, I'll ask I'll ask you the final question sure. here, a uh, question that I've asked both of them. Um, what would you think an anti-stigma campaign should look like, at least from a legal point of view? Mm -hmm. What loophole? What specific loophole is there that you'd want plugged? immediately to be able to get that, that, that campaign going? I think to get the campaign going, we need to have situations where people are trained to know about their rights mm -hmm. and uh, within the context of the law, what does the HIV Act say? What rights do you have? What kind of information do you have? Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that we have got the right laws and policy and gladly for HIV, we already have good laws in place and backed by the Constitution. So the back goes back to both the national and the county governments how they're rolling out services, how their services designed in terms of taking into account adolescents. Are the testing centers favorable to the children and adolescents? Are they passing the right messages to them? Are they insisting that they come with their children? And so for me, the framework, the legal framework has already provided an opportunity for the government to take this forward. The problem is around how we're enforcing the legal framework and again, the whole situation when the legal framework is not respected. Are people able to go to the HIV tribunal? Are people able to go to court to be able to ensure that their rights are enforced? So it is possible. We have the right legal and policy framework. We just need to have that implemented. All right. Thank you very much for joining Thank us this evening. Uh, Sister Mary, you had one final thing to say? Yes. Yes. In the schools, in one of the textbooks, it says AIDS kills, I think. We need to be informed about HIV, that it's simply a medical condition, like diabetes, like cancer. You follow? So it, the, it, I think one of the first things is to ensure that we educate ourselves right throughout the country, right down to the grassroots, yeah. that it's simply a medical condition. And you can live with it and live a full life. All right, that, that's a perfect way to end it, a perfect message to end with that HIV actually is a disease like any other Absolutely. that you can live yeah. with and you could be able to, to live an, a very fruitful life with. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, Sister Mary Owens from Numbani as well as you, Florence, and I'm from Nefak. This is a discussion that perhaps should have taken place a lot earlier, <laughs> a lot earlier in, uh, in, in, in this stage, but okay. hopefully President Uhuru Kenyatta mm -hmm. has heard the concerns that you all do have as well as the people living with HIV do have with respect to his directive on getting the names of children um, the mothers uh, as well as uh, their guardians uh, children who are HIV positive of course but there is a point to the discussion that we have been having this evening Yvonne Okwara has been listening very keenly I hope <laughs> to this discussion and has a point uh, to deliver with respect to what we've been saying Yvonne
Thank you very much for that discussion, John. Now, I think what is not in doubt is the fact that statistics are very important in the fight against HIV and AIDS in the country. And as we have seen, statistics do exist, just like what we showed you. 16% of the 1.6 million persons with HIV and AIDS are adolescents. So what we need to ask ourselves with this directive is... Are the statistics enough and where are the gaps and how do we need to fill those? Indeed, for many people who go for HIV and AIDS services in government institutions, they are identified by a code number and not by their names. If we still preach stigma, is this one of the ways that will in fact perpetuate the stigma? Like one of our guests said today, we still talk about AIDS kills. So does diabetes, so does malaria, so do road accidents for that matter. But if we start to handle HIV and AIDS in a way that makes it manageable, then we'll be fighting the stigma. And perhaps the issue of names wouldn't even be a case of stigma anymore. The other question is, is this a breach of the law? CIC seems to think so. They've written two letters to the president. Kinyua, who's the head of a public service, has written a letter to the CS of Health and the Attorney General to give direction to the president on the action taken. Kellen has just told us now that they've written letters to different organizations and different departments that deal with this to talk about the breaches in the law. Now, whilst the intention of this idea is not in question, definitely young adolescents who are more and more engaging in sexual activity at a young age are at risk. The question is, does it follow the law? And finally, on testing of children, we do understand from our guest tonight that there are um, provisions within the law as to how children will be tested. So that is not in doubt. But everybody asks about the other breaches of the law, invasion of privacy, doctor-patient confidentiality. And who exactly is handling this list? Is it a person of integrity? Those are the questions tonight, one month after the letter was written by Kenua to the Attorney General and to the Cabinet Secretary for Health. We're still yet to get a response to that. We're waiting to see whether there will be a response even as the process continues. Is it a breach of the law? That tonight is the point.